I'm Drew Hemmond, and I'm going to talk about bringing the future into the present. I'm at a lab and a festival where we use art and design to envision possible futures. More than that, we enable people to experience possible futures. And in that sense, we bring the future into the present. Now, some of my interests are social media, mass participation, uh, the impacts of social networks at a very large scale, and weather forecasting. Now, weather forecasting might be a strange addition to that list, but something strange happened to me recently in a project. I was uh, working with the Met Office uh, in the UK, the, the world's oldest uh, meteorological office, on some mass participation uh, projects on the environment. During the course of the project, one of the senior scientists was acting... I could only describe him as an artist, and he agreed to be described as an artist in the project. Then, during the project, I was responsible for uh, informing the public on uh, what the weather would be like. Uh, the, weather, the project was weather-dependent, and I, we had a direct line to the uh, chief forecaster at the Met Office. Um, I was getting updates from different climate models, absorbing them, and writing summaries on the website. After a while, I thought, hang on a minute, and I turned to my friend, the senior scientist come artist, and I said, does this make me a weather forecaster? And he's like, well, yeah, I guess it does. So it's kind of a, a, it's a new role I'm, uh, I'm exploring right now. My normal area of interest is in social media. And what I'm really interested in is media and technology as a social space. I'm not generally interested in technology for its own sake. I'm interested in its social impact, how it changes things, how it makes new things possible for, for good or for worse. Um, we're all familiar with the traditional broadcast model and we've moved to something different. We live in a peer-to-peer -peer world these days. Well, I'm interested in the different aspects of that, how we get reciprocal communication between people. I'm particularly interested in the area of locative media. That's an area I've been working on since 2003, been very active in new kinds of experiences that we, cre we can create with mobile location-aware media. But I'm also interested in how sometimes people can be passive participants in these kinds of networks and how that could lead to sometimes troubling consequences like surveillance, as well as, we would hope, some more positive ones. Example might be citizen journalism. Now, my approach that I'm going to outline to you is to try to bring the future into the present. And that means going in deep into some of these areas by creating experiences that enable people to envision them and experience them. But I'm also interested in mass participation. I'm interested in effects at a very, very large scale. And so that leads to the question, what might these effects look like? Well, you can probably guess that to me, they look a little bit like weather. So those of you who are as passionate about the weather as I am will recognise that as a cold front running down the left and uh, a warm front coming in uh, from the top there. But perhaps the difference between me and, I won't say weather forecasters, between my weather forecasting colleagues is that, like futurology, weather forecasting is about taking information from different models and making predictions about what will happen. I'm much more interested in intervening in possible futures. So I'm actually interested in, well, what happens if you go right over there into that cold front and, and play, play in that space? What can we learn? What happens if we bring that future into the present? I'm also interested, I put the festival up here. One of the main things I do is I, I run a festival, an arts festival. And at the festival, we passionately believe in empowering people. So that's... That's why it's behind the warm front, because it's trying to engage people, to create new experiences, to make things possible, to help build a better world. But I'm also a researcher. I, research, I work at a research lab at Lancaster University, and we're really interested in those moments where things detonate. And they might be the, the storm clouds you get between the two fronts, where the interesting things happen, the sparks happen. And, of course, we're trying to dispel the fog that uh, clouds all too often uh, our likely futures. So another map for what I do is this one. Um, I'm based at Lancaster University at a fantastic new lab called Imagination Lancaster. 
I also run a cultural festival. It was attended by 75,000 people last year, so it's a, it's a big event. And we stage, uh, within the festival, a large technology conference called the Social Technologies Summit. Now, these three together, they are my play space. I use the festival, we, with the team at the, at the lab, use the festival as a space in which we can experiment. It's a living lab. The lab and the university gives the festival access to the cutting edge in research. It's fantastic. I'm continually being inspired. The conference gives us a connection out into the world of innovation and allows us to have an impact in other areas. So these are, these are the space, this is the space in which I work. Now, I talked about using art and design, so let me give you a couple of examples of some just nice projects that we've done recently, and then I'll go into a little bit more depth on one of my own. So recently, I staged an exhibition called Social Networking Unplugged. And the aim of the exhibition was to enable us to understand social networking. And 30 artists were asked to respond to the theme and devise an artwork that essentially, it's not a conventional artwork, it's not a piece of painting you stick on the wall. They create a context for social interaction. And then we stage that with the public, involve the public in this, and then uh, sociologists, ethnographers, then observed how people worked in that space. So this one was called My Space, Our Space, Your Space, and this was all about how we create online personas. But instead of online, the artist restaged this by giving people cut-up magazines and bits of thread and a pair of scissors and some glue and a shoebox each. And they each got to create their own little MySpace. And we had these beautiful creations which we put in the front of a shop window. There was a messaging system on the back so people could swap messages between them. And then we stood back and observed. The artwork was the people interacting with it. And what we learned was how people interact and how people respond to these kind of social environments. In a similar vein, a project called Friends was all about social networking. An artist created a physical version of Facebook. You could create your own profile picture. You could uh, cut that out and have a little badge. You could put a friend request in someone else's book and they could uh, decide to accept you as a friend and stick you in or throw you away. You were able to, uh, uh, with a stamp, uh, leave a record of your username in other social networks. And again, it was all about trying to prise open social networking so we could understand it better. So, I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about a project which I think is all about bringing the future into the present. I mentioned earlier that one of the implications of social networking is potentially an unwelcome one. A possible future we may face is one of pervasive surveillance, where we're watched all the time, this information is out of our control, and this leads to troubling consequences. Well, my approach as an artist to that was to say, let's see how far we can take it. How far can we take that concept? How far can we push it? So, in San Jose, uh, a couple of years ago, we created an artwork called Loca, set to discoverable, and we deployed a network of Bluetooth nodes across downtown San Jose that monitored any, blue, any uh, discoverable Bluetooth device that, that went past the, the vicinity. We tracked these, and we could watch for patterns. And we looked for the social patterns to emerge. And then we sent messages to those people, responding to where they'd been, and also to the semantics of the local places. So to give you an idea what that looked like, this is the project. This is one of the nodes here, all made from cheap, readily available uh, uh, kit you can get on uh, eBay. We built the nodes out of concrete so they could be deployed in an urban environment. We spent several days installing them. Uh, it's quite remarkable, if you have an orange bib, police will just walk straight by, they just assume you're official. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible, really incredible. So we had them on lampposts, we had them under a, a bar terrace, uh, in a flower pot outside a hotel. And um, people who got one of the messages, um, the messages were slightly provocative, but they, if they accept the messages, 
then they're invited to come and learn more about the project. And when they came to our stand at the exhibition, they were, we, we swiped their phone and gave them an individualised printout of all the, the, the data points every time we detected their device. Some of, some of these printouts were 100 metres long. <laughs> In addition, we really wanted to take the project off the phone. So we had another kind of parallel version where we provided Loka stickers. And people just using their own device were able to scan using their mobile phone and any uniquely named device they detected, they'd write down the name of the device, the, 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 the time and date of location and stick it at the point of detection to leave a physical trace of the people passing through. And in this project, we presented it almost like a fictitious social network. So people were getting the messages from someone called Sly, who was being really familiar, as if they'd signed up to a social network and forgotten. Sly stood for someone like you, but they didn't know that. And at, at the start, the messages were really friendly. One to come for a coffee or some whimsical statement. But during the course of the project, they got just a little bit more sinister. Are you ignoring me? So this project is an example where we've taken a possible future, in this case one we might want to avoid, and we've brought it into the present so that people can experience that, we can have a debate and we can explore what the nature of that future might be. But what, I may hear you ask, does it have to do with the weather? Well, the big news, in case you missed it, is that the world's getting hot and it's our fault. And Another recent interest of mine is what happens if you bring together these two worlds, this world of climate and environment and this world of social media, and in particular locative media or pervasive media, which is all about a mediatised relationship to the environment. It's about experiencing, understanding the environment differently because we're, we're mediated by technologies. Now, I know a lot of phenomenally creative people working in, in my field, and I thought, maybe they've got some ideas, some insights that we can use to address this huge social challenge. And what happens when we include all the people in these networks, not just the ones who might be watching this or are in this room, but you know the people out there. There's, what happens if we might, for example, build a, a global observatory of a, of a billion eyes? What if we could give people new senses? What would happen? How can, we, how can that help us change our relationship to the environment? So we staged a few projects. Uh, one of them was called Biotagging. And this was all about uh, quite deep engagement with people on uh, how uh, local people can generate new knowledge on their local biodiversity. So we had a, a little version of the Mars rover. Uh, it was called Eve, uh, with a little weather station. And we went out through wastelands, through a local park. We met the local people, and we took data. And we essentially staged a, a, a folksonomy uh, of local biodiversity. So that was, that was one project. Another one, at a much bigger scale, was called Climate Bubbles. Uh, this was the one I ended up working on as a, as a weather forecaster. And we wanted to find a way of engaging many, many people in monitoring local climate, specifically wind flow, which would enable us to monitor uh, the urban heat island phenomenon. So we devised these two really simple uh, games uh, involving bubble blowing, the bubble race and the bubble chase. Basically, uh, we, had, we designed these nice little bubble kits, kind of like products, um, but we also had downloadable instruct instructions. And uh, people could make their bubble kits, and then with these two games, one of them, you'd blow a bubble, in some, starting somewhere you'd recognise on a Google map, chase it till it pops, blow another, repeat that ten times, make a note of where you, you end up, then on the map, draw a vector, that gives us direction of wind. The other one was a bubble uh, race, you mark out ten metres, blow a bubble, and boy, these things go, I can tell you. Uh, and with a friend, time how long it takes. You upload that with information on your clothing, which also tells us about the weather. 
And this was all uh, annotated to a map, which helped the Met Office build up their, their, inf their knowledge about uh, local wind, because they have no means of getting thousands of simultaneously, simultaneous readings uh, on the wind at this scale. So that was one project. And then another one, which wasn't tied into the science so much, originally it was, but it kind of spun off in another direction. We discovered that in, in Manchester, where we did these projects, you'd get local temperature different differentials that were really quite high. And we found that over a really short distance, you could uh, travel between a cold area to a hot area, and the difference in temperature was the same as the expected mean temperature difference over the next 100 years. So by walking from a cold area to a warm area, you can experience 100 years of climate change. So, uh, working with an artist, Yara El Shabini, we devised a sound walk. Uh, it was best at night, so we took participants in a bus to a park. It happened to be my local park, which was uh, quite convenient for me. And people walked from the urban area into, uh, into the park. They were asked to do strange things and to commune with nature and hug a tree. So these are some of my projects. Uh, these ongoing interests uh, are really uh, the focus of my work at the moment. We've got a project called Environment 2.0, but also with the festival, every year we stage interventions on a different theme. Uh, next year, it's uh, the city experiment. The year after that, we're looking at the future of transport. And I invite all of you to come and join us and bring the future into the present. Thank you.